fortunate to have Reverend Roland Jones preaching for us. Roland is a retired United Methodist uh, ordained minister, and he and his wife Irene decided to retire to Lebanon, and we're certainly blessed that they did. And we look forward to you bringing our message this morning, Roland. Thank you. Jesus, he's what life is all about. He's the way, he's the truth, and he's the life. And of him, we're going to speak this morning. Coming from the book of Luke. Verses 14 through 21, Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit, and news about him spread through the whole congregation. He was teaching in their synagogues, and everyone praised him, and then he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up, and as according to his custom, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day. He stood up, and he read the scriptures from the book of the prophet Isaiah. He, read, he opened the book and he found the place that talked about him. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted to preach deliverance to the captives and to those that are oppressed and then to give recovery of sight to those that are blind and to set at liberty those that have enslaving parts of their life. And then I am here to preach the acceptable year of God. And then he closed the book, handed it back to the attendant, and then he sat back down. Every eye in the synagogue was fixed upon Jesus. And this, again, is what he said. This very day, this scripture has been fulfilled while you were listening to it. They were a part of history like no one else. Then in the book of Romans, this is my version that I've written of the verses in Romans chapter 10, verses 14 through 17. So if you've never heard them before, this is the reason. They were written this week. <laughs> but they're similar to what they were. How can they not be? Okay. How can we call on Jesus unless we believe in him. How can we believe in him unless we hear about him? How can we hear about him unless Jesus is preached? And how can anyone preach who has not been sent 
Isaiah says, How beautiful are the feet of those who bring the good news of Jesus Christ. Our faith comes from hearing the good news of Christ. So hear the word of the Lord this morning with faith that has the star power to change our lives. Can I get an amen with that? Okay. You remember Charlie Brown of Peanuts? Quite a character, right? Charlie was always struggling to get things right. Can you identify with that? One night he's in bed. It's dark. He's alone. He's wrestling with his pillow. And this question comes to mind. Where did I go wrong? Then a voice out of the dark comes and responds to Charlie Brown. This is going to take more than one night. <laughs> Charlie Brown felt like his life had been train wrecked. His life was just in shambles. It was messy. It was difficult. And he was alone in his struggles. No one seemed to really understand Charlie Brown. Have you been there and done that? What Charlie Brown needed is something we all need. He needed somebody to come into his life and make the changes that he was powerless to make himself. Now, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand, but can you identify with that? I mean, there's things in your life that you absolutely are frustrated over and it just seemed to go on and on and on. And you need help from the outside. You know what Charlie Brown needed? He needed somebody with star power to come into his life and make those changes. We live in a world where people love people of star power. In the world of entertainment, wow. Star power people are the ones that bring in the money and draw the crowds. In athletics and sports, same way. Politics, same way. Religion, same way. Well, I can't go by that without telling you there is at least one person in religion that's got the star power for me. His name is Billy Graham. There's two other people that have star power in my life. I mean, like head and shoulders above everybody else. They're both women. Wow, that's unusual. One, one lady is no longer with us. Her name is Virgie. She lived in the hill country of Western North Carolina. She was a mother of six children. I was one of them. It's my mother. She's gone. 
But boy, does she still exert star power in my life. I love it. I owe her so much. And there's one more. Someone's been in my life for 56 years. She's a little lady. Small. Weighed 87 pounds when she said, I do. And I weighed 137 when I said, I do to her. <laughs> so the pounds have piled up since then, at least for one of us. Well, you know Irene. God bless her. There's one other fellow I've got to tell you about. It's an extraordinary story. And I, I just recently come across this. Someone sent this to me on Facebook, and here it goes. This man, his name is Sir Nicholas George Winton. He's a German Jew, born in England from German Jewish parents. Born in 1909, he's 105 years old. Wow, super kind of guy. During the war, Second World War, the Nazis were overrunning Europe. Oh, you know, the slaughter and the mayhem and the havoc and the death and the destruction they were creating. Someone sent word to him. He's 29 years old at the time in 1938. Come to Czechoslovakia and help us rescue our people. So he jumps on a plane and flies to Czechoslovakia, Prague, Czechoslovakia. And before long, he's a committee of one, seeking to rescue at least the children. To make a long story short, Sir Nicholas, he wasn't a sir back then, but he came one later by the British government. He organized safe passage for 669 children from Czechoslovakia, thereby saving their lives from the ovens of Auschwitz death camp. He had 250 more that were scheduled to come, but the Nazis overran Prague, Czechoslovakia. Instead of going to England, those kids went to the death camp with their parents and the parents of the kids that had come to England. In England, he advertised for homes that would take in these 669 children. He was successful in finding homes for, the, for all of them. He kept a scrapbook. He placed the scrapbook in an attic, a scrapbook that contained their names, their parents' names, their ages, and what homes they went into in England. And then for over 50 years, he forgot about it. Until now, we come to this video and a surprise of his life Are we ready? Here we go. But back here is the list of all the children. This is Vera Diamant, now Vera Gissing. We did find her name on his list. Vera Gissing is with us here tonight. Hello, Vera. And uh, I should tell you that you are actually sitting next to Nicholas Winton. Hello. <laughs> and it was just so wonderful, so Terribly, terribly touching. Can I ask, is there anyone in our audience tonight who owes their life to Nicholas Winton? If so, could you stand up, please?
I salute Sir Winston Winton. That was in 1989, 25 years ago. 15, over 15,000 descendants have come from those 669 people, those kids. And they all claim this man as their father in some way. You talking about star power, you know he's got a habit with over 15,000 people. It's never too late to do good. For years, he went unrecognized and unknown. There are star power people in our life that are unknown and unrecognized. But nevertheless, they hold important places of influence in our lives. Madeleine Albright, you remember her, former Secretary of State, was being interviewed last weekend. And they were talking about the mess the world is in. The train wrecks, you know, with guys like Charlie Brown. They were talking about, you know, you, the Ukraine and the separatists and Russia. And then they started talking about the Israelis, the Hamas, the Palestinians, the Arabs. That thing has been going on almost since the beginning of time. That, I think, is the most serious problem we face in this world. What Madeleine Albright said about all of that, and of course the gridlock in Washington, which is a terrible kind of thing, She said, the world we live in is a mess. And then she said, that's putting it mildly. I agree with her on both accounts. The world is a mess. And she did put it mildly. It's a lot worse than mild. It is extreme. And we look for people fix it. We want to send people to Washington who can fix it. We want people in the church who can fix it. We want people in our lives who can fix us. You've heard of Murphy's Law. If anything can go wrong, it will go wrong. Well, that's the kind of world we live in. I sort of think that's the kind of people we are. If anything can go wrong, it's going to go wrong. I've been there and done that. I know about things going wrong. You do too. Am I right? Chesterton, one of my favorite writers, he's been gone a hundred years. But man, that guy can write. He responded to an editorial in the London Times a hundred years ago. And a hundred years ago, they too were talking like Madame Albright. Well, this world is in a mess. What has gone wrong with the world? He wrote a letter to the editor. He said, sirs, I am. What's wrong with the world? What was he talking about? I know what he was talking about. You do too. Can I tell you what he was talking about? 
And it comes from the good book, the same book we gave to the second graders, the same book that we value and treasure tells us all. That means no one's left out, not even my mother in whom I never saw any sin. Never. All have sinned and come short, fallen short. We're not what God created us to be. I got to tell you, I believe that right there is the number one mess in the world, personal sin. And that brings us to the topic of this sermon the incomparable star power person of Jesus Christ. That's the background that makes Jesus Christ the goodness and the grace of God that he is. We live in that world of mess. I, I remember how vividly that came to me as a young teenager in North Carolina. My mother's at home alone one day. At least she thought she was alone. I mean, she knew she wasn't alone, the Lord was with her, but she thought no one else was in the house. She thought no other ears were hearing what she was saying. But there was a young teenage son hearing what she was saying. And she was groaning. And she was crying. She was on her knees in her bedroom behind the closed door. And she's calling out to God. She's calling out to the one that had star power in her life. Her husband, my dad, had betrayed his trust. And oh, it hurt. It not only hurt her, it hurt all six children. And it made one of the teenage boys angry. I mean mad. I mean mad as in rage. It rendered this family and kept them in poverty. But she prayed for her husband, who eventually came around in the latter years of his life. And she prayed for that wayward, rebellious, rebellious son. I hope you appreciate her prayers and value them because that's why I'm here today. <laughs> Joy knows a little bit about that part of the country. We have communion this morning. And communion to me has been... Um, even throughout my ministry, and certainly since coming to First Church here in Lebanon, it's, it's been something that I have looked forward to at least twice a month. Because what, what communion does for me, it magnifies the star power of Jesus Christ in my life and in your life as well. 
And nothing can compare to Jesus Christ. I'm a sinner. I'm in need of forgiveness. I'm wounded. John Setzer was a friend. You remember John and Marion. John and I were carrying wounds that were similar. And we were together in first church and in the questers class because there was a need in his life and mine and I have come to know there's a need in the life of many, many others. There's a need for healing of wounds. So John was being healed while he was here. And I'm a wounded warrior too. And some of you have been wounded throughout your life. I know. And you've come, you're coming to First Church in order to be healed by his stripes, by his death on the cross, through Holy Communion, we can experience the ongoing work of physician, Dr. Jesus, who heals. And sometimes it takes a lifetime to heal. And that's okay with me. I used to think I'd like to have it overnight. But like Charlie Brown, it takes many nights, many weeks, many months, many years. One more thing. You know, like each week we live our lives and life is sort of like a marathon. We, we run. We're in the sort of the rat race and we run and we run and we run. We exhaust ourselves, we get sweaty, we get tired, we get weary. And isn't it always a wonderful feeling to come home and to bathe, take a shower, and clean up? Wow! There is no feeling like the feeling of being clean. Now, I said that in order to say this. When we have Holy Communion, it's really God's way of cleaning us up on the inside. And I gotta tell you, I need to be cleaned up with regularity on the inside. I need it, I love it, I want it, and I've gotta have it. So communion is just that for me. I come for forgiveness, I come for healing. I come for cleansing. It's an ongoing thing. It's a long, long drink of salvation. That's what it's all about. Okay, Bucky, we're ready to go. <laughs> okay, now. What we're going to do, 